Trashomaniacs. Gearheads. Welcome back to episode 326 of the Geo Gearheads, the show for geolocation gaming and specifically geocaching. And tonight we're going to get even more specific than that because this is a show about what is my favorite iOS geocaching app, and that's Cashly. So we're very excited to have the creator and uh, lead developer of Cashly, Nick, on the show, also known as uh, Zed Said. Welcome to the show again. Thank you. Appreciate it. It's been a little bit since uh, we've had a chance to talk, and since then you've had a major release of the software, and we've had to change the name of the show twice <laughs> since you uh, released it because you keep doing those uh, dot one updates. So we had uh, 4.0, 4.1, and now we're on 4.2. Yeah, I I keep on adding stuff to add, so I I apologize for the name change. Oh no, we're we're more than happy <laughs> to change the name to get more cool. It'd just be features. 4.x, and then it doesn't matter, you know. Yeah, yeah, we we could do that, but you know, it's, it's not as exciting. True. All right. Well, let's start off with uh, some feedback that comes in from Tick Magnet, and he says, "Hi, Chris, Daryl, and Nick." And Chris should be joining us uh, shortly. He's still having uh, issues with uh, studios after that uh, power spike. Uh, good. Uh, my good friend G Nice is an Android user, and his app has a TV scanner and a Where I Go player. Jerry is having uh, something I uh, don't, uh, excuse me, Jerry having something I don't <laughs> makes life difficult for me. <laughs> Are there any plans to add these to Cashly? Seriously, I love the Cashly app. Thanks so much for the hard work. Um, so I'm moving towards having scanning. Uh, I think it was in 4.1, I added uh, QR code scanning. So if you have one of the new trackables, uh, like one of the dog tag trackables with a QR code, you can scan that, um, and that's right from the trackables tab. There's a little icon for that. Um, as far as like doing OCR text reading, um, that's something that I'm still looking into and working on. It's not as easy as just you know throwing it in there. So stay tuned for that. And as far as where go, uh, no, I haven't even worked on that. That's. <laughs> <clears throat> it seems like HQ has kind of abandoned that. Maybe if they pick it back up and it becomes popular again with, I don't know, maybe it would be something I would work on. So, but right now there's yeah. so many other important things to, to work on. So. Yeah. Where I go is officially not abandoned. It's just dormant. Yeah. Uh, and the, they are very excited about it. They just don't really know what to do with it is the uh, impression I'm getting. So right now, from what I'm hearing from other developers, the big problem with a where I go player is you pretty much have to write your own uh, um, interpreter because none of the uh, Lua interpreters available for iOS are 64-bit. Yeah, I, I looked into that and I found some open source code and I never got it to work. So that that is the big problem. Yeah, so I, I don't see much happening there, but we do have the official... Where I go app, which is no longer official, I think. I think it's back to uh, uh, the I developer out from, of Minnesota. Yeah, and I get the question maybe like once or twice a year. Like I've really only gotten asked by a few people. So maybe the demand isn't that high for my actual users, or maybe it's huge and people don't say anything. I'm not sure. So if you really want it, let me know. If you don't care, then don't say anything. <laughs> Well, I'd always like to tie in because, you know, whenever I see those uh, where I go caches, I want to go for them. Yeah. But it's an awful lot of work and a big pain in the butt to get out into uh, the where I go app, find the uh, cartridge, download and get back in. Yeah. That being the whole problem. Aside from that, you know, <laughs> uh, he also emailed that uh, he wants to know if there's a way to see county lines in Cashly. If not, would it be something that you could add to the app? Yeah, so there's two different maps that have county lines. Uh, the offline maps, Cashly offline maps have uh, county lines because those are basically OSM maps. And then the both the open street and the open cycle live maps uh, have county lines. So 
Um, sometimes you have to zoom in a little bit further, especially on offline maps to actually see the lines, they're orange lines, because um, they're not like viewable at state view or anything. Zoom a little closer and you should see those orange lines and those are the county lines. Cool. I, I like that, <laughs> but at the same time, I always worry about doing you know, the county lines on the maps like that because it's not, you know, if you're doing a cache that's like right near those lines, you have to be careful because it's not going to necessarily match whatever the polygons are that the uh, cache owner is using for checking. Exactly. Yeah. But at least it's a good idea. If you go a couple of miles in, you're going to be safe. So it's nice yeah. and handy for that. Yeah. And, you know, if you're in, you know, we'll say like uh, Ohio trying to go get a whole bunch of caches on uh, uh, your uh, uh, Geo Woodstock. I almost did West Bend. Uh, but your uh, Geo Woodstock uh, cache trip and you're going to only be there the one time, you want to make sure that you're going to hit those caches. Yeah, for sure. Which we might also uh, do a quick uh, plug that uh, they did just post today. The rates go up on Monday, which is April 2nd. And registration is going to close soon. So if you're thinking about going, you better get that uh, registration in shortly. All right. So 4.0 came out. That's the big news and why we got you back on again. Uh, and the big thing, the big kind of headline thing uh, uh, that a lot of people noticed is the support for the iPad. Yes. And that was something that I had thought about for a long time. People had asked for, and I finally decided to work on it. And it was actually easier than I had expected. So that was a good thing. <laughs> easier is always good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was just finding all the little layout things that are completely different on the iPad than they are on the iPhone. Like, namely, when you tap a button and it has a little a little pop out for a menu instead of sliding up from the bottom, that's you have to program in a different way. So that really, that was the problem is finding where all those were. And, you know, I would forget about some and my beta testers would find other ones and things like that. So, yeah, and I haven't had a chance to really play with it too much, uh, but I like the idea of having the iPad in the uh, car or, you know, at the table at the coffee shop. Uh, you know, my wife and I right now are trying to do a streak with the Planetary Pursuit, and I've used that yeah. a whole bunch now just because we've cleared out so much of the area and it's easier to sit there on the table with the iPad going, okay, this one, uh, no, this said, three DNFs. No, uh, not this one. This one's going to be in the mud today. You know, so it's just nicer to do it on the iPad than on the phone. Yeah. And and one thing I had to, I had to add was rotation support because on iPad, they, they want you to not just have like a, a portrait or a landscape app. So I added that and then it had to be here on iPhone. So that was actually probably more work was to add rotation support than just to add, iP you know, iPad support. So that makes sense. all this layout stuff was different and all the code that I had to make sure was, uh, you know, laying out correctly. So that was, that was the big bulk of work right there. Yeah. And I usually use the uh, iPad in landscape, not in uh, portrait. Yeah. So, you know, if you had just the uh, portrait mode, you know, which is essentially what you could do before, but it was in that uh, iPhone view. Yes. The big one. Yeah. It would work. It's just not going to make people happy, and it's not the experience that you want. Well, I actually had some people angry when it went to the iPad layout because they, it, it was kind of an accessibility issue where they liked it big, and so they said, "What happened? You know, it's so small now, and and I can't see anything." And so I was like, Ugh, "Sorry about that." <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, that, that's actually a good uh, uh, point. Is that some people are using that for. <clears throat> you know, the uh, visually impaired. Yeah, and so it made me think more about the accessibility stuff that is in, in iOS to make font sizes larger and things like that. So that's another thing I'm working on is to really work with those accessibility settings that people are using. Yeah, it would probably also be handy if you're like in the uh, car bouncing around because it's going to be a lot, you know, on the, in the Jeep bouncing yeah. around down that trail because it's, it's bigger buttons easier to hit. Very true, yes. All right, but uh, you also improved the uh, filtering with some templates now. Yeah, so that's actually something that we've had internally, like with my testers for quite a while. And I think it was, what what was it, 3.1 or something like that I released. It. And it was ready a long time ago, but there was just some small pieces that that weren't working correctly. So 
yeah, the templates are nice because you can set up a really cool template that you want to use across multiple offline lists, and then you can apply it to all those. And any changes you make to that template will work on all of them. So it was a request from some of my users, and it was actually a, a really handy thing to have, I think. so. Yeah, I, I have not used that yet, but I, I envision a lot more time spent with that feature in the near future. Yeah, that and, and filters can be complex. I mean, it's that's why we have a new wiki, which we'll talk about in a bit, to explain how that all works. Because that's probably the most complex feature in Cashly is, is that and filtering and stuff like that, because it gets kind of advanced. Yeah, filtering is... Uh... A very, very powerful feature and not uh, as easy as it looks. Yeah, that's because it's that's because it's powerful. <laughs> With great power comes uh, a lot of headaches. How's that? Mm -hmm. Anyway, the next uh, feature that we had on the listed mention was one we had a conversation before for actually even shipped. Uh, and I had mentioned in passing that one of the reasons a number of the cachers in this area still use Geosphere and haven't upgraded to iOS 11 because if you upgrade to 11, Geosphere stops working, was that you can create those uh, caches on the app and not have to go download them. So when we're at the uh, uh, meet and greet events, a lot of the time we get these little slips of paper that have, here's the event uh, 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 geocache that we created. You know, here's the GC number, the name, and where it is. And that's about all they'll give you. Yep. So you can't go and find it easily unless you can put it in. You know, the trick that a lot of people use was add it to a, uh, uh, or add it to the event as another waypoint. But that gets really, really messy when you have five or six caches and try to remember which ones. So I mentioned, you know, hey, it would be really handy to have this because of that. And I think it was the next day you said, oh, it's in there now. I, I think I said you convinced me. You, you had yes. sa said something, and then yeah. it, it made me think, okay, I better do this. And then in the next the next day, I get an email that said, it's in the uh, 4.0 release. <laughs> I was, it was just that quick and that awesome. Yeah, it, it was one of the last things I added, but it was actually a really fun feature to work on. So, I, yeah, I got it in there quick. And I know a few people around here now very happy and uh, at least a couple of them are uh, uh, looking at doing the upgrade to 11 and doing Cashly full-time now. But you, know, you get stuck in uh, that app that you use forever. I, I just heard today, um, oh, what's his name? I can't, it just totally dropped out of my head. The guy who writes Game of Thrones is using like a, a word perfect from the 80s <laughs> to write because he's just so familiar with it and he doesn't yeah. want to change. Yeah. Kind of like a lot of people were with the uh, uh, the original uh, geocaching or app. Yes, the classic. Yeah, the class. Yeah, that's what they decided to call it, the classic app. Yeah, and when that's just shut down, they got a little bit irritated. Yes, that there was a big uproar over that, and I think it's kind of died down by now. Oh yeah, yeah, it, it's, it's died I think it's down been over a year now, hasn't it? I think it was last March. Uh, I think end of March. I it? think it was right around this time. <laughs> Yeah, but I don't remember for sure. They they'd be giving us warnings for a good eight nine months though. So yeah, we all knew it was coming. Just you know, no one really expected it to actually happen, <laughs> <laughs> which is a problem. Yeah. All right, now you got to tell me how to use another one of the four point features because I tried to figure it out and I got lost. Okay. How do you set up the uh, uh, phone or text a friend? Uh, in the app so that you can connect it to your contacts. So you need to go to your iOS contacts and you would put their GC username in either the nickname field, the business uh, name field, and then that's what gets the two tied together. And so uh -huh. then if you go, if you've you know done that for a bunch of people that you know and you know their GC username, um, you go back to the friends area and cache in the more tab. And iOS will prompt you to see if you will allow contacts uh, to be, you know, brought into Cashly. Um, if you say no, you're not going to see that feature. If you say yes, uh, it'll run through and it will match those, and then you'll have options for texting or calling that person. So, and you can also have, uh, so if you have like a husband and wife team or something like that that you have in your contacts, and they're different contacts but they use the same username, it'll show both those people for calling or texting. It's not just 
um, it doesn't just pick up one of those. So it finds all the people with the same GC username and it will show those as options. So Got it. So it's doing a text yeah. match, though, on either the nickname <laughs> or uh, uh, company name. Yes. And that's yeah. my problem. I think I have those in the notes. So I've got to go in. Uh, it, it should look there, too. I, oh. I, I, need to look, I need to look at the code, but I, uh, there's a, a couple, quite a few fields that it's checking. Um, I think it's also in the notes. Okay, because I don't have any showing up when I go to my friends. It's just empty. But whatever I did is wrong. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll have to work on it after the show here. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, that that's one of those things I got all excited about. But in reality, most of the time I just go to the cache page anyway on the uh, website so that I can use a message center. Yeah, so, you know, it's, it hasn't been a detriment. Just you know. I want to be able to call and annoy my uh, friends. Yeah, exactly. And, and another thing I'm adding in 4.3 is currently if you go to their profile and you have their contact info, you'll have a mail option and that just goes to the website. But if you have their email address in your contacts, it'll just pop open the mail app if you want to email them. So even though we can't use the message center yet, that would you know be the next best thing. Yeah, very nice. Yeah. And that's going to be real handy for things like earth caches and uh, virtuals. Yep. All right, the last thing we're going to talk about in the 4 release was the uh, offline filtering. And yes. you did a uh, invert filter option. Yes, and that's another one that's kind of advanced and kind of confusing if you're not quite sure what it is. Um, and that's, again, why we have the wiki to explain all these kind of things. But that's basically doing the opposite of what you said in the filter, which sounds like, why would you do that? But for example, um, say you have a list with lots of different cache types, um, and you want to find everything but traditionals. So you would set the filter for traditionals, and then you'd invert the filter, and you would find everything but the filter. You know, what, what that filter is supposed to find, it would be the opposite. So you'd find all the other cache types except for traditionals. So it could be really nice. Um, another example is you could uh, do all, you know, a username, all the people that had placed a cache or something like that, and then you invert it, and you'd be any cache that that person hasn't placed, something like that. So it can be powerful. And it was actually a use case that one of my beta testers said, you know, I had to do all these extra filters and delete caches to, just to find these few caches that I want to do. And if there was an invert filter or a not filter for people that know about programming, uh, it would have just been, you know, one quick filter with a tap, you know? And so once we added that, it was just, it was simple to do certain things. Yeah, so when you have like that cache series that you don't want to hit, like for example, I've got uh, the outer drive series that I'm, you know, they keep showing up. It's like they're right there, they're quick and easy. No, no, I'm going <laughs> to filter those out so that I don't go and grab one because I want to save that for my power day of doing 200 and whatever caches on outer drive. Yeah, exactly. Let's move into the 4.1 features. And I remembered something about this. <laughs> and I, I got it totally wrong uh, because you're syncing just the highlights uh, via e iCloud across devices. So if I set the highlight on the iPhone, it's going to be on the iPad and vice versa. But that's yes. all that's being synced right now. And that's where I got confused. Yes. Currently, that's all that's happening because that's a much easier sync than a lot of the other things that could be synced. So and it's, it is pretty cool. I mean, it does happen pretty fast if you add them side by side and you highlighted one it would take maybe about eight seconds or something like that. And you'll see it pop up on the other one, which is kind of neat. Very cool. Yeah. And we had had a conversation earlier, you know, I was looking for it to sync like the, uh, uh, finds that, you know, the logs and the, uh, um, uh, templates. Cause yeah. I did a whole bunch of templates and I'd love to set up the templates on like the iPad where you have the bigger, better screen and keyboard, but that's not happening at least yet. Not yet. In the future, there'll be more syncing and more, you know, collaboration between your different devices. But that's that's uh, coming later. I love having that uh, multi-device thing. Even if I don't use it often, it is so amazing when you get that stuff to work right. Yes. Uh, you know, you, especially when you have someone doing like the logging on a power run. It's just amazing that you can do that so quickly that way. Yeah. And we already mentioned that you're doing the uh, scanning of the trackable QR codes, but that has to be the QR code on the trackable. Yeah. You know, I, I wonder if that works with the uh, uh, trick that um, I, I had been doing is just taking the uh, URL for the log page and put it in there. I'm thinking that probably doesn't. 
We'll have to try that later. Yeah, I'm not sure. Are you Did talking that, about a QR code somewhere? You know, well, I, I generate a QR code on a lot of my trackables. We've talked about it on the show a few yeah. times, and I had a blog post that it referenced on how to do it. But I actually link to the uh, logging page for that trackable so that it just drops the uh, tracking code in there. You pick what type of log and you're done just right on the website. It's pretty cool. But I'm imagining it doesn't work since that's not the way that uh, uh, the trackable the trackable with the QR code is done. They're just doing the... The trackable the with the QR link. code, it reads as the full URL to the trackable, I'm pretty sure. And then I strip out the rest of the URL, just get the code. So if you're doing the same thing, it would work. Yeah, but I'm going to the log page, which is a different so URL than page, going not to the trackable, trackable page. page. Right. Yeah. So It would still scan it, and you could open the log page. Oh. You could maybe try. Hmm. Well, you you can at least you can at least uh, copy the whole thing. Anyways, maybe it's something we could integrate if it's something that would be useful. Yeah, well, we'll see if it uh, works because it might actually work depending on how the uh, uh, URL is even constructed because I don't remember. Yeah, but it's as simple as like changing like one letter in the URL and it uh, changes it from. Or I think it's a number, but it cha- you know it sets the log type so you can set it to default to the uh, discover logs. Yeah. So, I love doing that for uh, trackables that I take to events. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. Anyway, uh, and then uh, pending logs now uh, allow you to do uh, some selection stuff. I think that was one of your f- feature suggestions, wasn't it? It was. Uh, again, for those events where we've got, uh, ooh, we'll say like 40 or 50 caches, you find a few of them, but like one or two of them doesn't get published with the rest, and it would just get stuck there before. Yeah, and you yeah. couldn't go past that until it was updated, or yeah. until it was published. Yeah, and you can use that selection thing to act to selectively delete as well. And yeah, it's a nice feature. Yeah, and the selectively uh, delete thing helps when you accidentally go and log the same cache twice. There you go. Which happened to me just last weekend, I think it was. Maybe it was two weekends ago. I accidentally logged the same cache like twice and a different one three times so oh. i was like why is this not working oh that's why because i'm an yeah. idiot <laughs> <laughs> and then some uh, performance updates to offline list yeah we had <clears throat> some power users that had you know like eight thousand caches in an offline list um and there was one guy who was telling me it would take like 15 minutes to update a a list. And I was like, that's ridiculous. That shouldn't be taking that long. So I went in and rewrote all the code for updating those to, you know, full caches. And now I have it down to about 40 seconds per thousand caches. So I think that's, that's pretty good with having to make, um, so you can, with an API call, you can, um, get 50 caches at a time. So, it's quite a few network requests and API calls, and sometimes you have to wait for 30 seconds before the API lets you to make more requests and stuff. But it's it's huge performance increases over the previous way. So, well, but it's if I remember uh, your previous uh, discussions on the way the database works in Cashly, you still don't want to do something like load in your my finds pocket query if you've got like. 15, 30,000 caches because it is still going to be kind of nasty to deal with. Is that still the case or have you uh, improved You mean because the enough? database size would be so large or? Well, because of the performance issues. You, you should be able to handle 30,000 caches. Um, no problem. Uh, there's some things that get a little slower, like when you're importing even more caches your database has to kind of deal with all those new caches and the current caches. So it gets a little slower as you continue to add just huge volumes like that. But no, it should be fine. Uh, Back in 2.0 was when the database wasn't built for that amount of caches. And then I think we changed it in 3.0. Maybe it was 2.0. Too long ago. I can't remember. I know that you had done some uh, major improvements, but you were still kind of uh, leery about uh, like 10,000, I think, was giving you some issues for one of the users. And yeah, I think that's, saying, I think oh, with this, so much. Yeah, with, with these, uh, these updates, yeah, you can bring in 50,000 or, or more. Give it a try. 
Excellent. So I'm I'm gonna go uh, you know after the show, download my my finds and load it in because I love having that okay. for uh, reference. Because you know, have you ever gone out somewhere and go? I know there was a cash here, but it's not listed anymore. Yes. And right now, that's the only way that you can get those archived caches is in the my finds pocket query, unless you know what the GC code was. Yeah. And archive caches used to show up in the API, and and they don't really anymore. I think it, they've been scrubbed or something like that, so they don't they don't show up anymore. All of them, I don't know why, but well, I thought <laughs> they still show up if you do the GC search. Yes, yes, but GC that's... search. But they used to show up in a regular search. Yes, randomly. So, ooh, randomly is not good. <laughs> yeah, oh, but I, I remember Chris. hearing from. Uh, uh, I think. Oh shoot! I was going to say Eric, but I'm not sure it was Eric. Someone was telling us that the reason that they had to do the. Um, inaccessibility of the archive caches was due to some of the agreements they'd had with land managers that mm. didn't want the archive caches to show up anywhere. So the solution was, okay, archive caches are going to show up if you know the GC, if you've already found them. You know, we can't delete them. Yeah. And that was acceptable. You know, just don't surface them unless they know that they didn't exist kind of thing. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that's good to know. So it, it was one of those uh, issues of, you know, they didn't want to do it, but in order to appease people and make them not get sued. Exactly. Just <laughs> yeah. Uh, and we've talked quite a bit about the uh, um, issues with the uh, orientation stuff that you had to go through, but it wasn't until 4.1 when you actually did a, a, a lock device uh, mode or lock orientation mode. Yeah, and I was I was kind of a little uh, I didn't want to do that for a long time. I just wanted people to use the regular iOS uh, screen lock, but there was a lot of users that convinced me that you know they want Cashly to be locked a certain way, and then there are other apps they use in a different orientation. So it was a huge pain for them to continue to unlock it, lock it, unlock it, lock it as they're flipping between apps. So I said, okay, you know, we'll add a dedicated lock in in Cashly. And if you want to continue using the iOS lock and ignore the Cashly screen lock, you can. Um, but there's a lot of users who wanted to, you know, just have it independent of the whole system. Yeah. Yeah. So that's going to be really nice, especially for like, uh, on my iPad, I don't want it to rotate as I'm like flipping it around to show to the wife. Yes. And that was the complaint it was like, somebody's walking in, they have it in their hand and it's just sitting there flipping back and forth, you know, because they, they don't have it locked. Yeah. Yeah. That, uh, that's happened to me quite a bit, actually, while I'm, uh, uh, you know, like walking to the cache and talking with someone. It's like, oh, wait, the screen's flipping all around. Yeah. And then that's one of the, the little things that you don't think about when you're when I'm first building it and then users are testing it and they're saying, oh, you know, this isn't this isn't cool. And then I have to go back and, you know, modify things that I didn't think about in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Until you get it out in the uh, uh, wild, you don't necessarily know all of the uh, situations that people are going to be using it. And even though you have quite a few beta users, do you know what that uh, group is up to now? Number wise, we have a hundred beta testers, but they're not all active. So there's a, there's a group of maybe like 20 that are really active. And then maybe like eight that are extremely active. <laughs> so, I mean, I, most those active users actually wrote the entire wiki site for me. They, they were volunteers. Um, so the certain small group of guys that are just extremely active and and they give me my most feedback for beta testing and stuff. But there is lots of other testers that will send me small little things every once in a while. So it sounds like it's kind of like the uh, geocaching community at large. You have a few people who are really into it, a couple of uh, uh, people who are uh, active on a regular basis and a bunch who just kind of do it on the weekends or whatever here and there. Yeah, I can see like what, version the beta testers have installed and if there's a beta tester that hasn't installed one for like six months i'll usually delete that user because if they're not providing you know any useful feedback then we'll find another beta tester yeah and if i recall (laughs) there is a limit of like 100 uh, beta testers in the uh, uh, test flight uh, program that's an old one it's now ten thousand. really yes wow yeah so it quite it got raised quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, 
well, that's much better because a hundred people doesn't really help if you're trying yeah, that, to do like that a, was a while back and it wasn't draft. it was a pain. Oh, that's awesome. But you mentioned the uh, wiki, which I guess was new uh, or newly released in 4.1. Yeah. So, I mean, it was there on the web, but I changed the help link in the more tab to be to the wiki now. And it used to just go to this internal help, which hadn't been updated for a while. And so now, now we can finally have something where we can dynamically update it a lot easier. But you do have to have the um, online connection to do that. So if you're True. out in the backwoods, you're not going to get help. <laughs> that make is the trade-off. Sure, yeah, make sure you know how to use Cashly before you go offline. Yes. And then uh, four two just came out, and I guess the big thing is editing logs, and I'm assuming that's once they've been posted. Yes, once they've been posted. So you can edit your live logs, you can edit your old logs, you can edit any logs that you have out there. Yep. And well, you, and can, you also... can edit any logs you have permissions to. So if you're a cache owner, you can edit logs that have been posted on your cache. Oh, interesting. Yeah. That will be quite helpful. Yep. Uh, and But you can also <laughs> add uh, uh, photos to the logs that you've created. Yes, you can do that as well. And you can delete them. Not the photos. You can delete the logs. The logs, yes. Yeah. But for uh, for going back in, you know, oops, I forgot to attach this photo or I took this photo on the way out. Yep. That's going to be really nice. Yeah. And that's something I wanted to add for a while and just had other things got in the way and finally got around to pushing out like a bunch of log updates. So that was kind of the 4.2 update was just about logs. I'm actually kind of surprised that's in the API. Uh, is that something that you're doing through the API or... Not it is really. through the API, um, oh. but I've been working working with HQ specifically uh, on testing some of these features. So I've been working with with them directly on it. Very nice. Yeah. So I'm I'm thrilled that the we've got that kind of functionality in the API because that's going to be really helpful for a lot of things. Like, oops, I accidentally logged this one when I didn't yeah. mean to. It was a bummer before when people would say, "Oh no, you know how do I edit a log?" And I'd say, "Sorry, you have to go to." geocaching.com go to your log and edit it there and you know they're already mm -hmm. on their phone and, and i don't think the log editing screen is mobile friendly yet on geocaching.com no. so it's it's really small and hard so uh, yeah i'm glad i'm glad that they can do it now too i, I got used to doing that but uh, fortunately i don't do that as often as i used to there was a point at which i'd fat finger the gc code <laughs> especially like the the event ones you know you fat finger it and log it and it's like uh why do I have a cache in Germany? <laughs> That's like I have a find in Ontario, and I, I cannot figure out where it came from or which which cache it is. So I need to. I have a a, a souvenir from Ontario, and I don't know how I got that. That seems like something that should be easy <laughs> to uh, figure out. It wasn't one of the moving caches. I don't know. I don't know where it came from. I've looked and looked. Can't figure it out. Wow. Yeah. Maybe they, maybe I got it for free, <laughs> or or maybe you found I had someone who was complaining that they uh, had a cache that was in the wrong uh, state when they found it, hmm. and it's when they went back they found out it is in the right state it was just listed in the wrong state. Oh, because. Uh, I don't know if you still can, but back in the uh, early days of geocaching.com, you'd list, you know, like Michigan, Ohio, whatever. And that's how they routed it to the reviewer. Yeah. So in some of the border communities, they actually told you, well, route it to, you know, this neighboring states uh, uh, reviewers because they're more uh, responsive because they don't get 50 caches a day. They only get like 10. Oh, Yeah. So they were reviewing the caches that way. And once it was in that uh, state, you know, they just left it there. So you'd get uh, like Michigan caches that were listed as Ohio when you did the search. Interesting. Yeah. I never, never heard about that I, before. I think they fixed that. <laughs> I don't test, think they we tested it. it we, we, well, we could, but I don't think uh, when you're doing the listings anymore, they even give you that option. Yeah, I'd have I, to go and double check, but I thought that went away with the uh, latest wizard. Yeah, I, I, it's been a while since I've hit a cache, but I do remember some sort of state selector, but yeah, maybe, maybe that was an old version, like you're saying. Yeah, because when I do the uh, um, 
events now because that's the only ones that I've hidden in probably the last eight months uh, when they had, wait, maybe it wasn't eight months ago. Maybe it was more recent than that. But when they did that uh, revamp most recently of the uh, uh, listing wizard, the uh, publish uh, new cash, whatever they call it. Yeah. Uh, they seem to have gotten rid of that because I don't think I've picked the city, or the uh, country or state like you used to have to. Now you just give it the chords and move on. Yeah, it's just doing a lookup with the coordinates or something. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> so I wouldn't be surprised at all if the uh, uh, cues are based on some kind of polygons on the internal side. And I don't know that oh, I'm sure. geocaching.com is going to tell us how they're doing that. But it, it used to be just based on, okay, you've picked Michigan, so it's Michigan. You picked California, it's California. You picked Germany, it's Germany. And yeah. that got, you know, then that's just where it gets routed to the reviewers. And that just got to be kind of insane when you had, you know, five or six reviewers for that territory. Yeah. So I think they've divided it up into um, polygon regions, you know, to say, okay, you know, this part of the uh, country goes to George, this part goes to uh, Michelle, this part goes to Pat, you know. Yeah. And I'd love to find out how they're doing that, but I don't think they'll ever tell us. Well, send an email to the help. To the help. Well, form. yeah. We, we will at some point have a, a reviewer's show, but we just haven't figured out how to make that really happen well. Because there's a lot of stuff like the reviewer tools that they don't want revealed. Interesting. Well, yeah. that'd, be a, that'd be a cool show to hear. Yeah. And eventually we'll have it. Uh, now, I know at one point you had been talking about uh, uh, trying to get uh, some kind of support going for the Apple Watch, but never came up with anything uh, interesting. Is that something that you're still uh, looking at or uh, kind of written it off at this point? Uh, I, I had mostly written it off, and then you you have been trying to convince me about it. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> and you, you brought up good points about... Uh, making it a companion with your phone. So instead of making it a replacement and you can leave your phone at home, um, making it just an, another way to, uh, you know, glance at your watch when you're already set that you're going to, you know, find a certain cache and you can look at your watch and see the hint in the, the description and maybe you do the log on there. Um, I think that's a way better idea than leaving your phone at home and trying to search for geocaches on your watch and use it as your compass and all that that kind of stuff that was what i wasn't happy with the experience because the watch doesn't have a compass and the networking is a big pain and all that kind of stuff on the watch so that's what i was dreading but if you know if i move a different route where it's kind of a companion to the iphone or the ipad app then i think that's something that i would be more interested in working on yeah and i would certainly get use of that but i'm not sure you know how many people even have apple watches that would use that yeah, like I was saying, my big thing was I like having uh, those details because I'll go into something like Periscope or the uh, YouTube live stream app. Yeah. Uh, and when you do that, you lose all access to it. So if mm -hmm. I'm not carrying the GPSR, I have nothing and I'm just stuck. Yeah. Plus, I don't get to log it until I shut down the live stream. And I had done a live stream one time of like four or five caches and I had to wait till I got out and go, okay, we found this one and this one. And okay. Yeah. Now that's I'm a pain. Yeah. I do get so the request I, I, every once in a while. So I, I, you know, users are wanting it more than like where ago player. So, well, that's good to know. Yeah. Uh, so maybe we uh, have people write in and let them let you know that uh, that's something they would actually use is just the companion so it's not the full features, just the info and the quick logging, I guess. Yeah, I would love to know how many users are, would be interested in that. All right, uh, anything else that's uh, coming up that uh, you've been thinking about or uh, uh, can mm -hmm. share that is definitely coming? <laughs> Lots of stuff I can't share. Um, of course. I don't, I don't love to give stuff away. Uh, trying to think of something that I could share. Uh, how about features that aren't going to be in the uh, uh, Cashly versions coming up in the near future? <laughs> features that aren't? Yeah, there's no Tupperware detector, right? 
No. You didn't figure no. that one out. Uh, people definitely want like a proximity alert, and that's something that some people hate, some people like. So I, I don't know. I'm still on the fence about that one. Um, because some people want it where you can just you know turn, uh, lock your phone and then walk towards a cache and have it beep when you're you know within 20 feet of it or something like that. So that's something potentially I'll be working on. Uh, yeah, I can see where that would be cool. You know, especially when you're out there. Well, and that would be handy for the watch too. You know, yeah. just you know, turn that on, send a notification, tap on it on the watch and open the uh, app and you're there. So if you've got one of those, you know, 1500 meter walks to the cache where it's, you know, it's right off the trail. I just need to walk and follow the trail 1500 meters. Why waste yeah. the uh, battery? So yeah, I can see that would be a really handy feature, but at the same time, if I'm doing a power trail, I don't want that turned on. Yeah. So it would definitely be a settings option. You can turn on and off. Yeah. Yeah. So that and yeah, nothing else I can share. <laughs> nothing else, huh? Okay. Got to save something for another show. <laughs> and I'm sure we will do at least one more show, but we are getting a little bit long. Um, good, good length, but you know, got to let you go and get to uh, programming the next version of Cashly 4.3. Very true. Very true. Any links you want to mention before we take off then? Uh, yeah, definitely check out the Cashly wiki, which in Cashly, you can go to the more tab and tap help and it'll take you there. Or you can go to, uh, uh, cashly.com and then click on the help tab on the top left or cash.ly slash help. So you can go there and my users are helping a lot with that, writing lots of good content. And so pretty much every feature and every detail of Cashly is in there and you can search for it and everything like that. And it dawned on me that a lot of people probably uh, listening to this, largely the Android users, uh, but probably a lot of uh, newer cachers uh, might not understand that Cashly is not the official app. It's a new, or not new, it's a uh, alternate app, the third-party app, I guess, yep. that most of the iOS users I know prefer. And it's, what, uh, uh, $7 in the App Store? Uh, $5. US? $5 US in the App Store. And uh, it's available for uh, iPad, iPhone, uh, iPod Touch too, if you have one yep. of those. Yep. Uh, but you have to have version 10 of iOS now. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So you can't go back to an old uh, 9 device and uh, continue to use it. You, you, you have to have a newer version. Yeah. I think, I think the App Store used to allow old version downloads, didn't they? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So maybe you can still get it that way, the old versions before yeah. three, uh, before four I think or three. Yeah, I think you can. You know, it, it will download the most recent compatible version if you had purchased it previously. Oh, that's what it is. But if you didn't, or if you didn't already have it, you can't purchase it now unless it's a, a current app. Is my understanding. I haven't Got tried it, okay. it, but that's yeah, my understanding. I, yeah. And Dick Magnet says, uh, thanks for all of the uh, great info. And uh, Houston, Texas Dave says uh, he loves Cashly. Good. Good to hear. Appreciate it. And White Coaster likes the feature not included in this or future versions. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So thanks again. And we want to thank all of our patrons for your support. That keeps the Cash Maniacs uh, shows, especially Geo Gearheads, because that's the only show that we currently have uh, going. <laughs> Uh, and reminder that uh, it is almost April 1st, so you're going to be seeing that uh, charge hit your uh, usually credit card or PayPal, whatever, account again. Uh, we really appreciate it. I've had a few more of those uh, host favorite picks coming out. Uh, I found a couple of cool things to share, and I've got a few more in the pipeline. So hopefully you're enjoying those. And Chris and I are working on trying to get things uh, stable enough to do another patron hangout. And Chris is actually here. He just can't seem to get the audio <laughs> interface working properly again. So, uh, unfortunately, about... nope, nope, still not, no. not quite there. No. Okay, it, it's almost, it's almost there. <laughs> I am still bouncing back though. <laughs> so it, next week he'll be back, and hopefully he'll be back for his show tonight. Uh, so yeah, thanks again, patrons. We hope to get, uh, another hangout scheduled, uh, before too long, but we really appreciate your support 
and keep it coming and you know spread the word you know especially if you know someone who uh, needs a little bit more info a little bit more pushing maybe on cashly make sure to point yes. them to this show now, also, we've got some more great shows coming up. Next week, we're going to be talking with Subway Mark about mass transit caching. On April 12th for show two, sorry, 328, we're going to be talking about puzzles again with Poker Luck. Then our next randomized show is coming up on the 19th. We know many of you, including Chris over there, who can't talk because his interface is host, uh, really enjoy those uh, randomized shows. So we've got another one of those, and we already have topics pouring in for that show. So make sure to stay tuned for that one. Then we're going to be talking about earth caching with a very reluctant land monkey because he doesn't talk <laughs> about earth caching ever. He doesn't like it. No, so that's the 26. So if you have any uh, questions about earth caching, make sure to get those in then. Meanwhile, check the Cashamaniacs website at cashamaniacs.com for more on the Geo Gearheads, including show notes for this and all of our episodes. We love hearing from our listeners, so leave us feedback by emailing geogearheads at cashamaniacs.com or through social media. Your support helps keep the Cashamaniacs shows coming. Please consider becoming a patron through the link on our website to support the Cashamaniacs shows. Geo Gearheads is produced by Chris Stefanauer and Daryl Wanberg. This show is copyright 2018 by Daryl Wanberg. All rights reserved. Cash with a cash of media. <laughs>